And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. We know that we really are quite behind in terms of maximizing our collective understanding about how we will engage on the technology of today and what we can quickly and easily predict will be the technology over the next decades. It is critical that we work together to understand where we are, to recognize and have the courage to speak truth about what is obsolete, and then to partner to ensure that we are speaking the same language with the same motivation, inspired by the opportunity of it all, but then doing the work of updating This has been Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. We're up to 25 episodes of Veep Thoughts already. Soon there's going to be more episodes of that than this show. It's blazetv.com slash stew if you want to subscribe to Blaze TV. Veepthoughts.com if you'd like to see all the Veep Thoughts episodes. If you're watching on YouTube, well, that's where the Veep Thoughts episodes might be stored. So you can check those out as well as clicking like on this video right now. We'd appreciate it. Brian Dean Wright is going to return to the show to break down all the Mar-a-Lago madness. California really doesn't want you to consider a move to Texas, so maybe it's time to take that leap. But we start by doing bribe. We start by doing Biden's bribery to bribery boogaloo. I'm a sucker for break into references. So we had to go this direction. And yesterday we did Biden's bribery. And you'd think, well, why are you back with Biden's bribery to bribery boogaloo on Thursday? Well, that is a good question. And it's because it's important to note, it's much worse than we thought. Yesterday, we kind of put the show together with an outline of what was reported on this big college debt relief uh, redistribution of wealth uh, program. And we did that with what we was, were seeing in all of the reporting leading up to it. He then, of course, updated it and added a bunch of extra programs and fluff and adjustments and all sorts of crap on top of everything else. So I want to get to some of that tonight. I want to get to some of the reaction to this plan tonight. And I want to try to take you through as much of this hellscape of a policy as we can possibly go through. Let's start with Biden the other day. He was speaking. He did his big press conference where he was totally alert and totally aware and knew everything about what he was talking about. And then as he was walking off, someone decided to actually ask him a question, and he stopped and took it, which has been very rare lately. Uh, he took the question, and it was about the unfairness for people who, you know, maybe didn't take out a loan or already paid their loans off. Listen to the question by the reporter, and you'll hear his incoherent response. Is this unfair to people who paid their student loans or chose not to take out loans? Is it fair to people who, in fact, uh do not own multi-billion dollar businesses if she wants these guys to get them all at that Is that fair? What do you think? Uh, is it fair to people who, in fact, do not own multi-billion dollar businesses to see what these guys get lower taxes? Is that fair? What do you think? It's a good answer. It's a good answer. Now, he's trying to play up this idea that they're blaming everything on the tax cuts from multiple years ago. You remember the tax cuts that just happened to coincide with one of the hottest economies we've ever had. Surely uh, those things were the enemy uh, and uh, his policy is the winner. We'll get into all that here in just a minute. Uh, Steve, no, Peter Ducey, one of the Ducies, was there talking to KJP, our friend Corinne Jean-Pierre, perhaps the w the single worst press secretary this country has ever had. And I want to say, that is saying something. She is 
literally terrible at this job. She has no idea what she's doing. She's completely unqualified. Her main qualifi- qualifications for this job are her skin color, her genitals, and which genitals she prefers. Those are the three reasons she got this job. It's clear as freaking crystal in this exchange. You heard directly from the president. Uh, This is something that is going to be important for middle class Americans. When you think about 90% of the folks who are uh, who are going to actually benefit from this are making $75,000 or less. And you think about what Republicans did just Uh, a couple of years ago. uh, They they signed off on a two trillion dollar two trillion (laughs) dollar tax cut for the wealthy and did not provide any way to pay for that. Who's and that this? Who's paying again, for this? here's what Says, we have you know, done. Here's you're what here's a lot about how much it might cost, it might not cost. Who is paying for this? What we are saying is the the work the that work. this administration has done, the work the that work is, the Democrats in Congress has done, okay, is work. actually there. And you see that the 1.7 okay. trillion uh, deficit in deficit, deficit. Uh, deduction that you De- see is, is going deduct- to benefit okay. us in being able to do something for the middle class, I to do class something is- for the middle class. This is about doing something for people who make less than $125,000. $1.7 trillion. That's what we've been able to do. But when you forgive debt, you're not just disappearing debt. So who is paying for this? this? And then I'll give you the second part. We lifted the pause, right? We're going to lift the pause Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of this year, which is going to matter, right? Which is going to offset uh, a lot of what what we're doing as well. Uh, Holy crap. And she really thinks the term is deficit deduction, not deficit reduction. She thinks it's deficit deduction. She said it multiple times. She doesn't know the most basic thing about this policy. She's reading it and she's completely oblivious. It's as if you have a younger, uh, more spry Joe Biden as your press secretary. She doesn't know anything about anything she's talking about. How is this possible? How is this happening in our country? God, I mean, if you, if there, she is a literal commercial for Jen Psaki. Like Jen Psaki went to an ad agency and she said, how can I look less incompetent? They said, hire Corinne Jean-Pierre. And they did. And now everyone thinks Jen Psaki was really good when in reality she was very mediocre to bad. But she's a thousand times better than this lady. Incredible. All right, let's go back and see how this works. Because over and over again, we've been told and we have known that the president of the United States cannot just, with a wave of his hand or a signing of his pen or whatever he wants to do, make hundreds of billions of dollars disappear. That's not how the economy works. It's not how our government works. That's not how any of this works. So let's look back at the people who told us that right-wing icons like, you know, Nancy Pelosi. People think that the president of the United States is this more on the subject than you ever want to know? Will you let me know? People think what? that the president of the United States has the power for debt forgiveness. No, they don't. He does not. You're right. He can postpone. Mm. He can delay. I guess. But he does not have that power. He that does not. Would, that has to be an act of Congress. That's true. Mm-hmm. That's true, Nancy. Now, let me give you one guess as to how Nancy reacted when she heard about this plan. Did she stick to that? Or did she say the complete opposite and say this was a bold plan by the president and we we love what he did here? Guess what? He said it. She said it was a bold plan. She just completely reversed herself as if you had no idea. You know, I listened to a bunch of mainstream media on this today because that's my freaking job. Not one of the broadcasts brought up that Nancy Pelosi quote. Not one of them could find it. Only we could find it. Not one of them could find it. All the resources of the New York Times and uh, ABC News and CBS News, none of them could find this. What a stunning surprise. None of them could find this either because they asked about this a year ago and they said, hey, Department of Education, what if we just cancel it by waving our hands? And here's what the Department of Education said. For these reasons, which were outlined in the memo, we believe the secretary does not have statutory authority to provide blanket or mass cancellation, compromise, discharge or forgiveness of student loan principal balances and or to materially modify the repayment amounts or terms thereof, whether due to the COVID-19 pandemic or for any 
other reason. Now, yesterday I showed you the piece of the law that they were trying to manipulate to turn this somehow into a justification for canceling all this debt. Now, it ha they had nothing. I mean, nothing. They had, there's nothing in there that would say that they could do this, but they were trying to base it on, well, there's some other stuff in there that kind of relates to it. That got blown up because uh, everyone saw through that immediately. So now they've gone to plan B. Plan B to justify this plan is the HEROES Act. Do you know what the HEROES Act is? Well, neither does anybody else. It's a very, very, um, it was, wasn't something that anyone has ever really referenced, but it was specifically about something totally different, as you might expect. Let me tell you how they're trying to manipulate the law to pull this off. The HEROES Act was signed into law by then President George W. Bush as part of the federal government's effort to provide financial security to soldiers fighting overseas. The bill grants the Secretary of Education the ability to, quote, waive or modify any statutory or regulatory provision applicable to the student financial assistance programs in connection with a war or other military option or national emergency to provide the waivers or mo modifications authorized. So they're basically ignoring everything about the military there and saying, keying on the words national emergency, then acting as if we're still in a COVID national emergency and saying, well, it's a national emergency, so he can wipe out the debt of everybody. Let me tell you what the, the point of this bill was, quite clearly from the person who wrote it at the time. Quote, by bringing a little more peace of mind to student soldiers, we are doing our part to protect them as they protect us, then said uh, Gen, uh, then Representative John Klein, a Republican from Minnesota, the author of the bill at the time. Got it. So we send our soldiers off to war. They've got a bunch of student debt. If they're out in the middle of a terrible war, they can't come back. They can't get other jobs. They can't pay this off. The Secretary of Education has some ability to cancel out or adjust the loan amounts if they're soldiers working in a time of war has nothing to do with COVID-19. They know this. They know all this information. I am not breaking this news to them. I did not go into the National Archives and find these quotes for the first time. They all knew this was the case. They're doing it anyway because they don't care about the rule of law at all. They don't care about the Constitution. They don't care about the rule of law. Nancy Pelosi will lie to your face any chance she gets to get one effing ounce of power in her pocket. And they all will do the same. This is who these people are. This is their defining characteristic. Believe it. Let me tell you about what this bill looks like, because I said the whole point of this was to show you this is not Breakin' One, which was a fantastic movie. This is Breakin' Two Electric Boogaloo. This is Biden's Bribery to Electric Boogaloo. So the point of this is it's getting even worse, just like Breakin' Two, I assume, was worse than Breakin' One. Um, here is the new estimate from, I'm going to give you a bunch, I'm going to give you a wide range here. This is the uh, one uh, from the uh, National Taxpayers Union. This is uh, $294 billion was the original uh, uh, cost savings, supposedly, from the uh, IRA, the In uh, Inflation Reduction Act. No one, no one on earth believed that they would actually save $300 billion from that act. They knew even if somehow it materialized, they would spend it anyway over a 10-year period. And instead of doing it over a 10-year period, they did it in an eight-day period. And so $395 billion is their new estimate for this plan. Under, uh, they, how, about, how much is it going to cost you? How much is it going to cost you? You might not have uh, taken out these loans. You might not have had anything to do with going to these colleges. But you need to pay off other people's future earnings. You need to uh, justify that expense for them. How much is it going to cost you? Well, they initially said it was going to cost $2,085. The new estimate is $2,503 per taxpayer. This bill is going to cost you. You like that? $2,500 per taxpayer. Isn't that wonderful? I think it's great. Uh, Cato Institute has an estimate as well. Theirs is a little bit higher, not $395 billion, but the new rough estimate is that the cost to taxpayers will be $427 billion. To put that into perspective, it is more than the gross domestic product of Hong Kong and 182 countries. For those who support federal social programs, it is nearly 36 times greater than the federal government spent on Head Start in 2022. And if you support defense spending, it is nearly two and a half times larger than the U.S. Army's 2022 budget. 
Breitbart had another estimate. Theirs was even higher. This has not been scored by the CBO or the various private outfits that estimate the cost of government programs, but we can offer a very rough estimate for the cost of all of these programs around $500 billion. And if that's not enough, it's not just $500 billion costs. It's who's paying for it and who's benefiting from it. Poker player Daniel Negreanu t- tweeted out, a, uh, you know, he's a guy who deals with statistics and odds all the time. And he looked at it this way. 13% of Americans have student loans. 65% of Americans don't have higher education. 50% of the debt is for grad school. There is no such thing as loan forgiveness. The debt will be paid by those who didn't take out the loans. But what is the effect, not just on fairness, but on our economy as a whole? What's this going to do? Well, we talked to you about Democratic economist Larry Summers just the other day. I'll give you that again. Student loan debt relief is spending that raises demand and increases inflation. It consumes resources that could be better used helping those who did not, for whatever reason, have a chance to attend college. It will also tend to be inflationary by raising tuitions. Now, he was one of the people who predicted this inflation wave not that long ago. And he said, hey, you know, this is going to cause inflation. And he was right. There was another guy on the Democratic side who was also right about this. His name was Jason Furman, another Obama era economist. How does he think this plan is going to go? Pouring roughly half a trillion dollars of gasoline on the inflationary fire that is already burning is reckless. Doing it while going well beyond one campaign promise, $10,000 of student loan relief, and breaking another, all proposals will be paid for, is even worse. And yes, that is the theme of the show. You thought it was bad yesterday, it's even worse today. You've got people I've showed you from the right who have criticized this. I've showed you libertarians who who have criticized this. I've shown you Democrats who have criticized this. Let me give you the mainstream media because even some of them are starting to come on board for this. This is from uh, an op-ed from the editors of the Washington Post. Quote, the loan forgiveness decision is even worse. Widely canceling student loan debt is regressive. It is. It takes money from the broader tax base, mostly made up of workers who did not go to college to subsidize the education debt of people with valuable degrees. Though Mr. Biden's plan includes an income cap, this is a very important point. The threshold does not reflect need or earnings potential, meaning white collar professionals with high future salaries stand to benefit. Got it? So you come out and you say, okay, I've got, uh, you're not making $200,000 a year, so uh, you are below the income gap. Maybe you're making $100,000 a year. Well, you might be a third year guy at a law firm making 100 grand a year with the potential of being partner in a few years, making millions. And yet you'll get this relief. Does any of this make any sense to anyone? And honestly, what I've discussed so far is the most coherent part of the plan. I have to, I just must discuss with you their plan to justify paying for this. Okay, this is from Joe Biden, and he's trying to somehow work around the single dumbest talking point I've ever heard in my entire life. Listen to this. As we provide targeted relief, we're taking an economically responsible course. As a consequence, about $50 billion a year will start coming back into the the Treasury because of resumption of debt. Independent experts agree that these actions taken together will provide real benefits for families without meaningful effect on inflation. (sighs) Okay, let me break this down for you. This is going to be a little bit of a challenge, but you must understand it. Let's just say you're a business and you're going to take in $100. You get two $50 bills coming into your business. Going to take in $100, okay? And when that $100 is about to come in, you say, you know what? Eh, It's a tough time for you guys. You guys hold on to that $100, okay? Now you don't have any dollars and they have their $100 still. And then you say... Well, I guess it's time. I guess it's time to do something. Your manager comes over and he says, hey, you can't just have zero dollars. We need to do something about this. And they say, "Okay, absolutely. You're right. And what he's saying is I'm going to go and I'm going to get $50 from that one person. Okay. well, what are you going to do with the other $50? I'm going to give it back to the other side. You see, we're lowering the debt. We've taken the $50 back and we've now given it to someone else. That $50 paid for the $50 of debt we are now forgiving. That is literally the argument they're making. They are saying they used to get $100, okay? Then they started taking $0. Now they're taking one $50 bill and giving it to the other people and saying it's paid off. 
Well, here's the thing. You only took in $50, not $100, and now you have $0. That is not paying it off. That has nothing to do with paying it off. It has nothing to do with being economically responsible. This entire plan is an abortion, and I live in a state where you're not allowed to do that anymore. Brian Dean Wright is next. Uh, I got to try this with my house. Hey, no, I'm just going to take out a loan and then I'm going to pay back the lender, two different lenders with the same money, and then tell them they're fully paid off. Let's see how that thing works. If you're buying a home, no matter where you are, you're not going to be able to get away with that. But I will say you can least you could first of all, you could try it. Who knows? Maybe they're as dumb as Joe Biden and Corinne Jean-Pierre, and it'll work. But you do need a great real estate agent to help uh, smooth that process over a little bit. You need that person at realestateagentsitrust.com. Realestateagentsitrust.com is a great website that's started by our own Glenn Beck, and he decided he wanted to make sure we didn't have crappy real estate agents for everybody. Some sort of process to go through these people and make sure you're getting the best. You deserve the best. Wherever you are, wherever you're moving, whatever house you might be selling, give them a call. Well, actually, you're going to go to their website, and then they'll call you. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Go there now. The information, you give them a little basic information. The team will contact you and make an introduction to the best agent in your area. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. I'm happy to welcome in Brian Dean Wright. He's a former CIA operations officer and the host of the President's Daily Brief podcast, which you can subscribe to right now wherever you get your podcast. It's a great listen. Brian, how's it going? Good. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thanks for coming back on. I want to get to the Mar-a-Lago stuff here in a second, but I am being driven completely insane by this debt relief, uh, debt forgiveness nonsense from President Biden. Uh, what's your take on it? All right. So there's two questions here that I think that we fundamentally have to wrestle with. Do people need relief and do they want relief? Right. Because those are two very, very different things from a policy perspective. Right. So do people need it? Well, the Federal Reserve Bank in Philadelphia asked borrowers that question over 13,000 of them and asked the question, look, if you were to get debt relief, or, or not, could you still continue to pay either way? In other words, do you have the resources? Do you need debt relief? 75% of people said, no, I don't. I, I can still continue to pay my payments irrespective of any kind of debt relief. Well, that tells you that, that most borrowers, the vast majority of borrowers in this country do not need it. Now, interestingly, they asked a follow-up question. All right, well, would you like to have it? Would it be nice to have? And 86% of them said, yeah, that would be great if you don't (laughs) mind. So (laughs) shocking, right? So I think that really puts it into stark relief, doesn't it? It it tells us that this whole effort and this initiative really doesn't address a need. It's all about a want, which then kind of tells you this might be a little bit more political than anything else. No, I mean, it certainly seems like nothing more than just trying to buy a bunch of people's votes for an election. You know, I can certainly picture someone who doesn't pay close attention to politics, maybe isn't following the day to day uh, back and forth. And then all of a sudden go, has a five hundred dollar a month payment that goes to zero. And they're like, well, hey, this sounds great. I get that. I get why this might work on some people, but it also activates something really dangerous, I think, in our society, which is telling a large swath of the American people who did not go to college, who did not take out these loans, who are not responsible for this debt, that they who don't have the advantages of a college education have to pay it off. You're activating a piece of the forgotten man out there that is that is going to add to the consternation in this country. Look, I think you're absolutely right. You're talking about the unintended consequences of doing what really probably is a very political act, right? You might be able to buy votes, which, by the way, happens all the time abroad. It's it's and frankly, down in Mexico, lots of places even close to us. But the point is, it's not a really good sign of a healthy democracy, of a good, strong republic of buying votes. Right. But you were talking about things that that really ultimately impact the medium to long term you know, health of a country. And that is that is right. You are absolutely right. We should be talking about what happens to a culture when you really start picking the winners and losers in a pretty egregious way. And the losers get very, very angry and upset that they keep losing, that you don't sustain a country that way. And it's a shame because we could be talking about the 20 percent or so of people who were you know, interviewed by the Fed up in Philly in that same survey, uh, uh, survey rather that I mentioned. 
And they said, yeah, I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time paying these bills. So we could talk about those 20% of people, reasonable people might be able to disagree or agree on a solution to that. But instead, it's just everybody gets it because they want it. And that's really dangerous. Let me ask you one more on this. As far as like the going to your CIA expertise here, countries are based on a structure that in some ways is only there because it's it's accepted and enforced. Right. The Constitution. I love it. But it's a piece of paper. Right. The reason why it's important is because of the ideas behind it and the fact that people actually respect it and pay attention to it. When the president of the United States can have his own Department of Education, the, uh, his own uh, leader, uh, Speaker of the House, say he has absolutely no authority to do this, and he walks through that wall anyway, aren't we sending a signal that none of these institutions matter? You are so very right. Look, the, the Constitution and all the laws that flow from that, that is really a covenant between all of us, uh, uh, You know, not only the people and our government, but just between each person. And that's how the country functions, as we all agree to that covenant. But when you start saying, as President Biden has done, not only in this iteration, but in others of, yeah, yeah, I know what the Constitution says, I know what the laws say, but I'm going to do whatever I want anyway. Now, maybe the courts will strike it down, you know, uh, whether it be Supreme Court or otherwise. In fact, there have been cases where Biden has said that openly, that he knows that the Supreme Court's going to rule it unconstitutional, yeah. and he does it anyway. All right, he's breaking the covenant that he shares with the American people and that we all have to make this country really what it is because your point's correct. Otherwise, all these laws and the Constitution just become a piece of paper with nice ideas. Mm. Well, these institutions are teetering right now. And I think, you know, Amen. For for really sc scary reasons. I mean, the Mar-a-Lago raid is is part of this, and I, I look at this, and my instinct is this is unbelievable that they did this. Not only did they do it, they did it without seeming real justification, other than a documents push, and also with no warning, no build up in the media, no alert that something like this might be coming to prepare the country who's never seen anything like this before. What does this mean in the grand scheme of things? And is it even mildly close to the right thing for the FBI to be doing? Well, I think that really at the heart of what your concerns are is you're saying, should I trust the FBI to do the right thing here or at all? Mm -hmm. In fact, has the FBI given you or I and, and people listening and watching, have they given us reason to doubt, to, to, to you know, believe that their trust is, would be misplaced to give them? And I think the answer is we have good reason not to trust them. We've seen it for years now from uh, James Comey, the former FBI director, leaking to The New York Times, causing, forcing a, an appointment of the special counsel uh, that really had no justification for it. Obviously, Bob Mueller found that to be true. From that, we have seen multiple cases of individual FBI agents lying to judges, you know, falsifying evidence so they could get affidavits to spy on Americans, violating civil liberties. So look, we have very good reason, multiple examples over the past five plus years to say, we're, we have uh, some suspicions about the FBI's motivations here, politically motivated uh, you know, action, actions and behaviors. So when it comes to this, the guy that they've been targeting politically for years, Donald Trump, they're at it again. Well, maybe they are, there's something here. Maybe there's a concern with these documents. But the history suggests that we might have a problem. So you're right. There should have been a lot more transparency um, about what was going to happen. And, and we haven't seen it. No, we haven't. Um, can you take me back to you mentioned this on one of your podcast episodes. You went back through a Supreme Court ruling. I think it was from 1988 that kind of set the basic baseline for how documents uh, can be declassified by a president. And, you know, the, yeah. the left likes to say this thing didn't exist, but it seems to be quite clear. So what's so fascinating, uh, so two things, let's talk about the case. 1988, a guy sues the federal government, the Navy specifically about what he can or can't do in terms of getting his security clearance and problems related to it. During that case, the Supreme Court said, look, the president of the United States via Article 2 can declassify virtually, if not everything that he or she wants to. All right. So back in about five or six years ago, uh, then President Trump said something similar about declassification. Uh, I think he spoke something that was classified and he said, look, when I say it, it's declassified at that point. And there were fact checkers at Washington Post and other leftist outlets that were like, yeah, you know, he's right. Because of that case, he has broad authority to declassify things. And now, 
suddenly it's like that case never existed or that previous example of him declassifying something just by sort of presidential waving of a wand. Right now, suddenly where there's a problem, it's very suspicious to me that they're not bringing this back up or suddenly questioning what they knew to be true before. So it makes me feel like that there's politics involved in this declassification debate all over again. Yeah, it really does. Politically, Brian, how does this play out? Because, you know, if let's just say a couple different ways this could go. It could be a, a disagreement on the classification of documents. And if that were to happen, he didn't follow the process. Maybe they th- they decide they're going to ignore the Supreme Court case, whatever they think. That's not something that's going to hit politically at all, I don't think. I think that's a to- total non-factor. If the president of the United States, who could have seen all of these documents when he was in office, happened to have some of them at his house, I don't think that's a big deal at all. The next step of this is what they're, they've been leaking, and the FBI wouldn't leak anything about the raid or anything like that, but they've been leaking to Maggie Haberman every 10 seconds and pointing yeah. out, hey, these might be uh, nuclear documents. They might be uh, highly classified things that he was treating recklessly. And at that yeah. point, it escalates. If Let's say that's true. It escalates that controversy a little bit, right? And I think moves it to a partisan controversy, something like the Hillary Clinton email thing, where maybe the people on the right don't like it, the people on the left, uh, you know, didn't care. Maybe that flip-flops and something like that. The only way I think this makes a real political impact to Donald Trump is if he had these documents and he was using them for his own benefit in some way, some, whether it's for money or for political advantage. Do we have any, any evidence whatsoever that he was doing any of these things? To date, absolutely nothing. We'll see, hopefully, uh, at some point Friday or next week, what was in the affidavit, much more information about whether or not that's true, because I think you're right. The ultimate concern there would, for the American people would be, how are these documents being used for the, his own particular you know, monetary you know, value or purpose? You know, he's making money off this stuff or he's doing some, some sort of shenanigans. Then we would probably be rightfully concerned. But I'll tell you what I'm mostly concerned about right now is the intelligence community is about to get wildly politicized again. Why? Because they are being asked by Democrat leaders in the House and the Senate to conduct a national security damage assessment about these documents being in a facility that's not secure. Well, that means that there are likely going to be some potentially partisan individuals in the CIA, the FBI, and the the, uh, DNI, it's called, the Director of National Intelligence, and they're going to decide how bad this really was. Well, we have seen through whistleblowers of these organizations in the past that they're nothing but partisans. So they're going to potentially label these things as terrible national security secrets that have te- you know, terrified the nation and caused problems for us everywhere. And that's going to be something that the president uh, Trump is going to have to defend himself on. And if he's running for, for office at that point, well, that becomes a political headache for him. Uh, a lot of people are, are just going to look at, hey, the document was stamped top secret. Why did you have it? Right. You shouldn't have damaged national security. And he's not going to be able to point out, you know, the, the, the or he's going to have struggled, I think, at some level to, to explain this when the intelligence community says you did something wrong. It's a game. And I'm, I'm very, very concerned about how it's going to be played. Mm. Uh, speaking of games, I want to give you uh, one clip from the press conference yesterday. It was a, the press conference about uh, the loan disaster we talked about at the beginning. But this one was a question about Mar-a-Lago as Biden is walking off stage. Listen to this. How much advance notice did you have of the FBI's plan to search Mar-a-Lago? I didn't have any advance notice. None. Zero. Not one single bit. Thank you. Is there a person on Earth who believes this? Uh, well, uh, let's see. Helen Keller, who uh, is also <laughs> deaf, blind, dumb, and all. You no, know, no one believes that. Look, his team knew exactly what was going to happen. They got a heads up. It's not written down. There was a conversation. It was quiet, and that's that. That's how it works in D.C., and that's how it works at the White House. So. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like Nothing one of these things that was true. Yeah, it's like it's one of these things where they say, well, we're going to have a pizza party tomorrow. OK, uh, well, I've ordered the pizzas. They're on the way. OK. And then no one warns him that the pizza is actually showing up at the door. So he says he has no he had no notice. Like you knew the pizza party was happening. Uh, I just I just I mean, it's so in- unbelievable that they're still trying to claim this. I don't know. Totally Brian transparent. Dean, yeah. Right. Yeah. Brian Dean Wright. He's, uh, uh, of course, uh, hosting the president's daily brief. It's a great podcast that you should never miss. It's a great one. Uh, it's available wherever you get your podcast. Brian, thanks so much for breaking this down for us and coming back on the, on the show. As always. People think that the president of the United States, is this more on the subject than you ever want to know? Will you let me know? People think that the president of the United States has the power for debt forgiveness. 
He does not. He can postpone. He can delay. But he does not have that power. That would that has to be an act of Congress. How old were you in April? Do you remember that time? Not April 1918 or April 1964, but April 2022. That's when Nancy Pelosi said that. I want to give you her statement from yesterday. President Biden's bold action is a strong step in Democrats' fight to expand access to higher education and empower every American to reach fulfillment. Does anyone suck more than Nancy Pelosi? Of course, the answer to that, we all know, is no. And that's why we have Nancy Pelosi sucks pens. We have Nancy Pelosi sucks mugs. We have Nancy Pelosi sucks shirts. You must own one of them. I don't care which one it is. You can go to Nancy Pelosi sucks pen. That'll bring you to the site. You can see, get all three of them there. Uh, but I will tell you this, NancyPelosiSucksPen.com is a great resource for all your Nancy Pelosi sucks needs. And I will say, of all the things that we can, we can go back and forth on, there's a lot we might even disagree on, even as a viewer of the show. We can all agree that Nancy Pelosi sucks. Uh, well, Uvalde School Board has voted to uh, unanimously fire Police Chief Pete Arredondo. Uh, this isn't exactly a huge surprise. I don't know if you've heard the news. Maybe he wasn't doing such a great job there. Uh, he's gone. A uh, 17 page press statement said the district wasn't following legal procedures. It moved to fire uh, Arredondo. Uh, that was his comeback on this one. I'm sure there'll be legal wranglings about this. But, uh, you know, obviously that was a terrible, terrible thing. And now California is trying to take advantage of it. Now, we've seen a pretty interesting uh, pattern where candidates try to build their political profile on the backs of dead children. It's been a great approach by Beto O'Rourke here in Texas. Been really his only argument uh, to be governor. Not working so far. Gavin Newsom seems to be doing the same thing. And now someone, and we don't know this is specifically tied to Gavin Newsom, but we do know uh, these are mysterious billboards going up in uh, in California, which is really kind of interesting. It says, don't mess with Texas, the slogan, and it's crossed out. And it says, the Texas miracle died in Uvalde. Don't move to Texas. Now, there's also a possibility that people from Texas pulled up these billboards and just said, please don't come. We don't we don't want you here. That's possible. But um, the theory, what we're seeing is so many people with a lot of tax base leaving places like California and going really anywhere else. I mean, there's a lot of Nashville. There's a lot of Texas. There's a lot of Florida. There's a lot of Arizona. There's a lot of different places. Um, and it's interesting to kind of see this play out. Why would you need to scare people from leaving? I don't ever say, hey, guys, don't move away from Texas, please. I never have to say that to anyone because no one does it. And if they do it, eh, most of the people who leave, I'm probably okay with it. Not all of them. Some of them are cool. They go there for, you go to other places for jobs or family requirements, whatever. You hate to see them go. But I never say, oh, please don't leave. We can't lose more people here in Texas. There's so many people coming to Texas. I never have to worry about that. Uh, but that is uh, a bizarre, bizarre development. Another bizarre, bizarre development. Marjorie Taylor Greene, now for the second night in a row, has had her home swatted. This one at 2.53 a.m. Now, if you don't know what swatting is, it is a vicious and dangerous uh, thing that people do to others that they don't like. Basically, they call the police and say there's a murder going on at X, Y, or Z's house. Police show up with their guns, uh, thinking they're trying to stop some terrible incident. And then, of course, everyone's just asleep. And the hope is that Marjorie Taylor Greene wakes up in the middle of the night, uh, does, you know, takes one wrong step and something terrible happens. Uh, or at the very least, she's woken up in the middle of the night. Now, the people on the left are saying, I think it was Marjorie Taylor Greene herself who did it. Now, if that's true, that will be absolutely bonkers and an amazing, amazing story. And, you know, if that were true, she should not be in Congress. Uh, but there's no evidence that that is true. What supposedly happened was um, you had a, 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 a robotic voice that called up, an AI type voice. So they don't really know who it was. Um, there was another one that came into a suicide crisis line. It is a very, very strange, strange thing going on here. And look, it is way... 
we have a lot, a lot of people you don't agree with on the other side. If someone on the left is actually doing this to Marjorie Taylor Greene, you might not like Marjorie Taylor Greene. You might not like what she stands for. You might not like her positions. That's insane. You could get somebody killed doing that. We should, that, that's not something that uh, should, should be going on. Uh, one more thing that should not be going on. Uh, Novak Djokovic, uh, who is you know, the best tennis player in the world. Still, he's been the best tennis player in the world for a long time now. And he was supposed to play in the U.S. Open coming up. He will not be allowed to because he is unvaccinated. This is completely insane. First of all, he's had COVID twice. Okay, so he's got a good chunk of natural immunity. Secondly, he is, of course, of no real risk. He is a tennis player in incredible shape. He can run around for hours and hours and hours on the court. Uh, His chance of ever being affected by COVID, even if even when he got it, was very, very low. The crazier part, though, is that we are at a point of low risk for COVID. We have been this is the this is the best stretch we've had since the beginning of COVID. Uh, We are at about 400 deaths per day. Still too high. We'd like it to be zero. But it's been between, you know, two and 500 deaths per day for multiple months. We've never had a period like that since COVID started. We've really got to a point where we've kind of done pretty well getting this under control. And Novak Djokovic played in the U.S. Open last year when things were much, much, much worse. So they let him come into the country when things were worse and he hadn't had COVID two times. And now he's had COVID two times. He's still unvaccinated. They will not let him in because he uh, can be blocked at the border. A completely insane decision. And at some point, at some point, we have to get by this. I will say we are by a lot of it. You know, very few schools have kids with masks anymore. You probably don't have a a requirement for a vaccine at your place, a mask uh, requirement. Most of that stuff is gone. There are still stragglers, and we got to keep pushing until the nonstop craziness of these stragglers is fully put down. Okay, so here's what happened. German Chancellor Olaf Schultz. I, I will. Is there a point where you change the chancellor thing? Do you really want to be a, a, a German chancellor? I, can you change it to like head of state or big man on campus or big cheese or something? I, do you really want to be a chancellor in Germany? I don't know. Uh, so he's doing a photo op and he gets a protest. This happens to you know world leaders at protests. This one in particular uh, was interesting. It was um, uh, it was about gas imports, and it was a topless, topless protest. Now, for some reason, women think this is a good way to protest. I don't know why. Uh, really, no one gets your point. There, you've got you've got your boobs out. So, what people are talking about are your boobs, not whatever you're supposed to be protesting. Now, this one in particular has a uh, the protesters wrote on their chest gas embargo now, which in some ways you could see making sense, right? Like everyone knows people are going to be looking at your chest. Good place to put the words, right? The problem is when they show pictures like this, you see a black box has to cover their chest. So now we can't even see the words that are on their chest, which makes no sense for the media hype you're trying to generate. Secondly, Look at Olaf Scholz, German chancellor. Look at where his eyeballs are. I mean, he is doing the thing that every guy would do. He's, of course, reading about the protest. That's where the words were, remember? So, okay, let's get to reviews. Uh, Five stars is the appropriate number of stars. Wherever you get your podcast, please subscribe. We do appreciate it. Great balance discussions. Really appreciate the perspectives from both sides of the issues you discuss. Obviously, I like the moderate perspective. Thanks. Uh, don't accuse me of having the moderate perspective on the show. We will get canceled immediately. This is Blaze TV we're talking about. How dare you? Uh, Walker One writes, uh, this will get tied up in court, the uh, school uh, loan bailout, and ruled unconstitutional. I do think that's a possibility. It's probably our only hope. The problem is if they give the money out, they're not going to take it back. So it's got to be blocked with an injunction or something pretty darn soon. And the details aren't even official yet, so we have some time. And it's not just Jerry Nadler's pants. But his belt also, yes, the belt is way up above the nipples. He wouldn't be able to do a topless protest. He'd still have pants covering his nipples. That's Jerry Nadler for you. See you tomorrow.